Chapter 16 The Soul Shear Still reeling from the night's events, Joe was almost afraid of Karen's last words to her. She went right home and bummed around her room for a while, thinking. She was, in a way, glad that Karen had made a move. If nothing else, she knew now that the attraction wasn't just one way, and that her friends knew. But she had still been caught so completely off guard that her head was still spinning. This wasn't a heart-to-heart. -heart. In real life, so to speak, Joe wasn't nearly as good at thinking on her feet, so she didn't know how to react. Eventually, Joe decided that she could only wait to take Karen up on her last words and talk to her about this tomorrow. Anxious for tomorrow to come, she ended up turning in earlier than she usually did on days when she wasn't tired from fighting. That night, Joe dreamed. She dreamed the same dark, disturbing, nightmarish dreams that she'd suffered for as long as she could remember. As usual, Joe found herself enveloped in darkness and felt somehow alone and like something was prowling through that darkness looking for her all at the same time. It was the first time since the first night that Karen had stayed with her that Joe had had the dream, and it made her uneasy despite how used to it she was. Between the early bedtime and the nightmares, Joe woke much earlier than usual the following morning. She felt that it was too early to call Kimmy's and wake up Karen, and looking for something to occupy her time, she made her way to Wilson's. She doubted that her teacher would be awake yet either, but that didn't mean that Joe couldn't use the space behind his dojo to train a bit. The more she thought about it, the more excited she felt. A good few hours of training would help clear her head. A few shadow steps later, Joe had arrived at her destination. She looked around at the space behind Wilson's, at the scars that remained from her team's first fight against Karen's soul takers. Many of them had been repaired, but the rubberized turf was still uneven compared to what it had once been. That battle felt like so long ago now, with how much her entire team's feelings about Karen and her friends had changed. In fact, thinking of the two groups as dueling hearts and non-dueling hearts wasn't even appropriate anymore. Things had changed so radically that remembering the time when Karen had been Joe's enemy almost gave her whiplash. Joe stepped to the center of the rubberized area, squared up her stance, and took a deep breath. She'd been trying to avoid thinking about Karen, and now here she was doing exactly that. She began running through her forms, trying to distract herself, even as she wondered exactly where she and Karen were supposed to go from here. Did Karen want a relationship? Thinking about that, Joe felt overwhelmed. She liked Karen more the more they got to know each other, but her thoughts on the matter had been so far removed from the idea of those feelings ever going anywhere that she hadn't even begun to consider if they might have a future together. Then there was the other question of interest. If Karen didn't want a relationship, then what did she want? She was certainly playful to a point, but she didn't seem the type to lead someone on. Was she interested in something physical? That idea was so flooring to Joe that she had to literally take pause. Karen was beautiful, there was no missing that, but when Joe thought about Karen, that's never where her mind went. In fact, as far as Joe could remember, she had never been interested in a physical relationship with anyone even on the rare occasion that she had found herself drawn to the idea of romance. Either way, these were complicated questions that Joe couldn't answer without knowing more about what Karen was thinking, which meant waiting until the two of them had had a chance to talk. So, as she was prone to do with anything difficult that didn't involve fighting, Joe put it out of mind and readied herself to begin running through her forms again. That's when, suddenly, she felt a ping of her sixth sense. She somehow knew that someone was watching her from the back door to the dojo. She turned with a start, relieved to see Wilson standing there, wearing a robe, holding a steaming mug in his hand. He smiled at her. I didn't mean to interrupt, but when I realized that you were out here, I thought we should talk. Thankful for this additional distraction, Joe nodded, and she followed Wilson inside. Even before they had crossed the threshold, Wilson said, I've been thinking about something. Ever since this Reaper fellow arrived in town, I've been considering sharing something with you. Something related to your training that I've been putting off for your own safety. The two of them reached the large main training room. Joe wandered a bit toward the center, watching Wilson as he paced and continued to speak. My method for training you, he explained, has been fairly simple up to this point, I think. I have focused primarily on giving you advice to hone the basics of your abilities, and then guiding you as you expanded upon those basics how you would. I did show you how to produce a life energy aura, but for the most part, I haven't passed any of my techniques on to you as another master might. I wonder, have you ever wondered why that is? Honestly, Joe told him, not really. You're like me. You see soul as a form of expression. Wilson stopped pacing, turned to face his student, and smiled. That is one reason, yes, he confirmed, but there is another. The fact of the matter is that all of my advanced techniques are specific to myself, save for two. And those two techniques are not specifically mine. I learned them from two other fighters who are much more talented than myself. The first, the life energy aura, I have already shared with you. The other, however, I hesitate to even mention. 
It's a technique that you could conceivably use, but especially for someone with an unnatural soul, it is almost irresponsibly dangerous. Until now, Joe had been interested in this conversation only as a means to occupy her thoughts, but this got her attention immediately. What? Is it something that could go out of control, and you're worried that because unnatural soul is hard to control, I'll accidentally hurt someone? In a way, yes, Wilson answered, but I don't fear for the safety of those around you. I fear for your safety. This technique, if you lose control initiating it, could turn inward and fatally wound you. You'd have no way to defend against it. However, he said, though his words were weighed down by palpable levels of hesitation, if you can master the technique, you will be able to, at the very least, fight on the level of virtually any enemy. The technique that I'm considering sharing with you was shown to me by its creator, the same fighter who damaged their leader's soul and inadvertently caused the injury that's slowly killing him. In fact, this technique is the very technique that he used to inflict that injury. Joe gasped, but Wilson ignored her and continued. That technique is the soul shear, he explained. It is a person's literal internal soul forged into a blade that doesn't behave as soul normally does when manifested into the physical world. It can be blocked by large enough concentrations of soul, but only for a time. For reasons unknown to me, he explained, soul in this form doesn't play well with other energy, including other soul. It disrupts it. That's how their leader's soul was damaged so badly, because a divine soul is more tangible than a regular one. Severe enough damage to one can be permanent, causing an injury which drains a person's life energy so bad that they waste away. Most importantly, though, Wilson explained further, the soul shear is the most versatile technique that I've ever seen. When I say that it is raw soul, I mean that more literally than how the term is usually used. It is soul in its true natural state, wielded as a weapon. For that reason, by default, it's non-lethal, passing right through a target almost completely, dealing its damage chiefly to their soul, polluting and disrupting it. But it can be made to harm a person's life energy as well, or even a person's body, adapting to the needs and the will of its wielder, just as soul adapts to a person's personality. If brandished properly, it will even alter itself at a metaphysical level to adapt to a wielder's fighting style, or even to counter other techniques and abilities. Superficially, Wilson concluded, his tone turning dire, what the technique allows you to do is extend not an aura of soul, or a construct of soul, but your literal internal nexus of soul energy past your body and solidify it into a blade that resembles glass. That blade can be made so fine that it can cut and disperse soul itself with no resistance. But if you fail to solidify the soul properly, it will turn back on your body in the form of hundreds of tiny crystalline shards, cutting you apart from the inside out. Wilson paused. Joe, meanwhile, was too forward to speak. She was still internalizing all that Wilson had told her. He could see that she needed a shock to get her going again, so after a long beat, rather than say more, he focused his energies, mixing them together at the core of his being. A wispy, sparkling aura sprang into existence around him. The energy that Wilson produced was so intense that Joe had to take a step back. His aura rippled, and Joe could see his energy traveling in waves down his left arm. He held that arm out straight at his side and his energy extended past his hand, flattening out instantly and forming a perfectly flat, crystal clear, single-edged knife blade about ten inches long that hovered just past his fingertips, tethered to him by an invisible force. Wilson gasped, and both the aura and the blade disappeared in an instant. He doubled over, and Joe, who had a moment ago been transfixed by her teacher's power, ran to his side to ensure that he was alright. He stopped her, straightening back up and taking a deep breath. His hands were shaking a bit, but otherwise he seemed okay. He smiled at Joe. As I have said before, this frail body isn't quite what it used to be. Given more preparation, I could no doubt sustain both my aura and my soul shear for much longer, before either became too difficult to bear. But that little display was an entirely spontaneous one. That's not what's important right now, though. Now that you have seen the technique for yourself, what do you think of it? It's impressive, Joe replied. It was like an avatar, but at the same time I got a completely different vibe from it. Like it's somehow more real and less real all at the same time. An apt enough way of describing it, Wilson told her, nodding approvingly. As it stands, that is just the furthest that I have been able to take the technique myself without aid. It's the basic, quite painful but non-lethal form of the technique. It would still harm me, most likely fatally, should I forget all my time practicing and lose control as it's forming. And it will interact with other soul constructs, but if it comes in contact with a person, it will pass through them, feeling like several hits at once along its entire path, but not killing them. You, Miss Zeger, Wilson said excitedly like a salesman finishing a pitch, are far more talented than I am. I believe that you may even be more talented than the incredible fighter who taught me this technique. I believe that you can master it, and maybe find ways to use it that even its creator couldn't envision. 
More importantly though, even the first form of the technique may be of use to you, as it may be able to harm the Reaper, despite his remarkable defensive abilities. Do you think I can master it by the time the Reaper comes back? Joe asked. If Karen's right, he might show up again in as little as a few more days. No, Wilson replied, I don't, to be perfectly honest. But if we're careful, and you don't push yourself too far, I see no harm in getting the process started. After all, even if you're not able to use it against the Reaper, knowing the technique will allow you to make use of it against their leader in the event that you must face him in the future. That's right, Joe agreed. You said that the Soul Shear is what hurt his soul in the first place. If I know it, I can finish the job. Joe was shaking with excitement now. She wasn't blind to the risk that learning this technique posed. In fact, no technique had ever pressed her fight or flight button as hard as this one had, but she was confident that she could learn it, a natural soul or not, given enough time. In fact, Joe saw the entire thing as a challenge, and she didn't like to let challenges go unanswered. Let's do it, she told her teacher. Anticipating his next words, she said, Don't worry, if you say so, we'll stop. I trust you to know my limits even better than I do. Wilson nodded. All right, he said, stepping up to the front of the room. In that case, we don't really have enough time before the Reaper comes back not to begin now. Joe and Wilson spent the next several hours together at the dojo, working on the Soul Shear. Joe became so focused so fast that she lost track of time. She almost forgot to get something out of Wilson's fridge to eat for lunch. Wilson tried his best to explain the process of creating the Soul Shear to her, but his words weren't enough. He explained that it was more about the feeling of the process than anything else, but that words couldn't really articulate how it was done. But because he didn't have the stamina or the good health to show Joe the technique again, she was left with just his words and the memory of it from earlier to go on. Finally, at about 2.30 in the afternoon, Wilson declared an end to their training for the day. Come back tomorrow, he told Joe. I'll meditate for the rest of the day to prepare myself to show you the technique in greater depth then. Joe nodded and wished him luck, thanking him before heading home. She walked back, rather than a shadow step, all the while thinking about the possible ways that she could work the soul shear into her fighting style. Suffice it to say, Joe had successfully distracted herself from thoughts of Karen, so you can imagine how surprised she was to arrive home and find Karen waiting for her in the living room with Shannon. Hey, honey, Shannon said, smiling at her daughter. I thought I'd get to know your friend a little better while she was waiting for you to get home. Hey, Karen said, waving and smiling at Joe over her shoulder. She looked back at Shannon. Thanks for keeping me company, but I need to talk to Joe alone. I hope you consider my offer, though. I would love the chance to test myself against a master. Shannon hesitated before nodding, saying, I will. Don't worry. She stood up. I'll leave the two of you alone so you can talk. I have things to be doing anyway. Shannon walked past Joe, out of the room and up the stairs. Meanwhile, Joe never took her eyes off of Karen. Once she was sure that her mother was comfortably out of earshot, she walked further into the room, sitting down across from Karen right where her mom had just been. Finally, she replied to Karen, saying, Hi. Joe didn't know what to say or where to start, but thankfully that didn't matter because Karen spoke next. I'm sorry, she said. Yesterday, I shouldn't have put you on the spot like that in front of everyone. I was trying to be cool and dramatic. I thought that maybe you liked me and I wanted to say something, but I couldn't come up with a way to do it that didn't feel all cheesy, so I thought I'd try for cool instead. I didn't even consider that you might not want people to know. It's not so much that I don't want people to know, Joe argued, confirming through her lack of denial that Karen's suspicions about her feelings were, of course, true. It's that I hadn't decided how to say something to them yet. She paused, careful to choose the right words before saying, You and Monty and Lawrence used to be our enemies. I was worried what my friends might think if they found out that I had feelings for you when I said that we could trust you. I was worried that they wouldn't trust me anymore. That makes sense, Karen acknowledged, and if I had just talked to you like this instead of doing what I did, that wouldn't have been an issue. You could have explained things to me and waited to tell the others until you were comfortable that they wouldn't care. I don't blame you, though, Joe told Karen hastily. My friends are good people. They'll deal with it one way or another. This is me overthinking things, I'm sure. But knowing that doesn't make things easier, Karen said, completing Joe's thought exactly. The human psyche is too complicated for something like logic to keep it in line. I'm also a little worried what my mom would say, Joe admitted, the words tasting bad on her lips, if she found out that I was interested in another girl. I did at least manage to keep that much in mind, Karen assured her. Don't worry, I didn't say anything to her about us. Though, I will say, I think she's starting to like me a little bit. That might be a good sign. She smiled at Joe, and Joe laughed. They locked eyes for a few moments, and then Joe said, I can't quite believe that you actually like me back. Karen's smile widened, and I can't believe that you'd think that. You're strong, and cute, and pretty damn heroic. 
You stood up for me, even when the person coming for me was myself. There isn't a single thing I've learned about you that I don't like. Jo blushed, but before she was able to say anything else, she noticed that Karen was blushing too, which caught her off guard enough to silence any potential response that she might make. Awkwardly, Karen stood and said, So, yeah, I wanted to apologize and explain myself, which I've done, so I'm going to go, leave you to it. She started toward the door, but Jo reached out and touched her arm, giving her a pause. You don't need to be sorry, she told Karen. It's really okay. And, she paused, her words catching in her throat. Once all this Reaper stuff is over, I'd like us to go out sometime. Like, on a date, if you want to. Karen looked back at Joe, smiling. I'd love that. She kept walking, an extra spring in her step, calling back, See you later, as she swung the door open and stepped outside. Immediately, Joe felt like an enormous weight had been lifted from her shoulders. Having her feelings for Karen, at least mostly out in the open, transformed those feelings from a hindrance to just another aspect of Joe's life that she could handle in due time in any of a dozen different ways. Things were going to be alright. 